few people have had more experience with the way inquiries can intersect with the Indigenous community than, than uh, the Honourable Justice Marie Sinclair. He was co-commissioner of the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, uh, part of which, uh, whose mandate was to examine the, the death of Helen Betty Osborne, which is one of the earliest and prominent examples of, uh, murdered indigenous, of a murdered Indigenous woman. He is the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, who will table their final report on the residential school era this summer. And he is also a very devoted father and a very devoted grandfather. So please help me welcome Honourable Justice Murray Sinclair. I am not yet visible on screen. There we go. Um, I uh, I want to begin first of all by acknowledging this young boy who was throwing things at Wob <laughs> and uh, letting him know that uh, there were lots of other people who wanted to join him. I've known Wob since he was a little boy, smaller than this little boy, and I can assure this young guy that there was a time when Wob would not have returned that item. <laughs> I'm going to exercise a little uh, judicial authority here and ask you all to stand up and wiggle your backsides because I know you're getting stiff and tired sitting there. <clears throat> and those of you on the balcony, don't be careful about bouncing, okay? Because I always have this uh, thought that balconies are inherently treacherous. All right, you look now like you got some blood flowing to the right parts. I want to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to be here. I originally sent my uh, presentation by email to Wab and he looked at it and he said, Oh, it looks like you're going to take at least an hour to talk about that. And what I didn't tell him was that actually I ended up cutting about 30 slides out of this thing in order to get it down to a workable number. Um, but I um, was asked if I would talk about, um, based on my experience and my knowledge of uh, how inquiries are conducted, the question of how Aboriginal people might have a meaningful input into the uh, development of and the function of a public inquiry. So um, I've given that some thought and I thought I would uh, share some of those thoughts with you uh, because uh, it, ha it was always an important part of the work that I did with the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry as well as the, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And uh, one other inquiry that I did preside over was a fatality inquiry into the deaths of children at the Pediatric Cardiac Surgical, surgical Unit here in the city of Winnipeg, where uh, participation by the families of those children who died was a, a hurdle at the outset that we had to address. And, uh, I've always felt it was very important that those who are most directly affected by the issue that's under investigation by an inquiry have a meaningful role in the way that the inquiry goes about its work. and. Uh, you have to look at uh, what kind of an inquiry you're holding in order to determine what that role can be because to a large extent uh, if you are working with an inquiry that is created by federal or provincial legislation you have to draw upon the legislation that creates it. In uh, the case of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission we were uh, able to work much more freely because the commission was not actually created by legislation. It was created by the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. And they have this wonderful phrase in the settlement agreement which says that the commissioners can do their work in whatever way they see fit. So based upon that uh, and recognizing of course the limitations of time and money that we faced, uh, we tried to do our work as, uh, as broadly as we possibly could. So. So I worked at different inquiries in different ways, doing different kinds of things, and I'll uh, share some of those thoughts with you. 
to begin with. I'd like to acknowledge all of the family members of those who are directly affected by the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and the transgendered victims as well, as well as the families of the men who are missing and have been murdered and whose cases are unsolved, or even those whose cases are solved and uh, still feel a sense of injustice around that because uh, I know that there is a heavy burden that is placed upon those who remain behind to come to terms with that loss. And that's often a burden that is difficult to achieve. And if I have time, I'll, um, I'll read something I wrote about that for you. Do I hit any button here? Anyone in particular? I'm going to hit anyone in particular and see what happens. <laughs> it worked. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about some questions I think that uh, we need to consider. First of all, by show of hands, how many of you believe that we need to have a public inquiry? How many of you believe we should not have a public inquiry? And how many of you are just not sure? A fair number of you are not sure. Well, good. I'm glad we've got a mix of people here because then that'll ensure that the discussion afterwards will be interesting. I think the first question we have to ask ourselves is what is a public inquiry? Now, a lot of people talk about it and use the term without really understanding what an inquiry is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Public inquiries are generally created by legislation, created by a government acting under a legislation of some kind. You can have public inquiries that are created in some other way, such as through an agreement like the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. but most inquiries are created as a result of an order in council that is passed by a cabinet acting pursuant to either federal legislation or provincial or territorial legislation. And those pieces of legislation that mandate an inquiry or allow an inquiry to be created generally have limitations upon the functions of an inquiry and what an inquiry can and cannot do. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, for um, before I leave. The question often is asked is why is an inquiry necessary or why should we have an inquiry? The first rule is that if there are other means by which you can solve the problem that you want to look at or need to investigate or need to determine answers for, then you don't need an inquiry. If there are meaningful ways by which you can get to the bottom of an issue or address the problem, then an inquiry is not going to be a useful way of uh, dealing with the energy, the time, and the resources that you've got. So some of the questions that you need to ask yourself is whether it will help the victims. Those who have been victimized, whether as uh, victims of the murder or who have gone missing, or the families of those, or the communities that they come from, or the nation itself, or the First Nations people, or the Métis communities, or the Inuit communities, whether they will benefit from having an inquiry being appointed in order to look into the circumstances surrounding not only those specific cases but around the questions generally that uh, arise when it comes to the large numbers that uh, we are faced with. You always have to ask the question of whether an inquiry is the best use of time because an inquiry will inherently delay every other process that's going on. If you have an inquiry, generally criminal investigations come to a halt or if there is a criminal investigation, generally an inquiry will come to a halt. Or if there's a criminal proceeding that's underway, an inquiry is precluded from conducting its work while there is a criminal proceeding involving the very same parties involved in the inquiry. So sometimes there can be a conflict that you need to keep in mind as you go forward. Is the uh, creation of an inquiry the best use of scarce resources? One of the questions that you always have to consider, particularly in the, in the nature of a public inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women, who's going to pay for it? Obviously, if it's created by the Government of Canada, the Government of Canada will pay for it. But where are they going to get the money? They don't create money. They take it from uh, tax revenue. And if they take it from tax revenue, then what other programs are likely to be affected by an inquiry like this? What would an inquiry like this cost? I could see this being a significant cost 
issue to conduct an inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women. That's not to say you shouldn't do it just because of the cost, but you have to recognize that if it is going to be a costly venture, that money's going to come from somewhere. And it may come from existing programs. It's likely, in fact, to come from existing programs. The practice of governments often is to take it from existing programs. They don't budget in their annual budgeting to hold public inquiries. They don't have a line item saying this year we're going to spend $150 million on public inquiries in this province or in this country. So if they decide in this particular year that they're going to create an inquiry and they're going to spend $50 million on an inquiry, then they tell their staff, now go out and find us $50 million from the existing resources that the government has. And they'll find it, I suppose, if they're told, but they'll find it by taking it away from something else. And what will they take it away from? You need to ask yourself that question. What would an inquiry look into? There are two kinds of inquiries generally. There's public policy inquiries and there are fact-driven or case inquiries. Case inquiries are those kinds of inquiries that look into specific cases. Those of you, and there are a few of you in this room, who are old enough to remember the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry in Manitoba back in 1990, will recall that the AJI held really two types of inquiries. We held an inquiry into two specific cases, one into the shooting death of J.J. Harper in the city of Winnipeg by a city of Winnipeg police officer. And the other inquiry was into the murder of Helen Betty Osborne in 1972. Those two cases were specific case inquiries in which we held hearings separate from each other, calling forward those who were suspected of having been involved or who had been involved to ask them what happened, why things happened the way they did, who did what, where, when, and why. And if there was any suggestion that wrongdoing occurred, then we had to be careful about ensuring that those who were suspected of doing wrong were given proper notification and were protected in their rights. But in addition to those two cases, the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry also looked at the overall question of what is the nature of the relationship between Aboriginal people and the justice system, and why is that relationship the way that it is? And that's more of a public policy inquiry. And we conducted those hearings as well. But there were different kinds of hearings. We didn't have lawyers involved in them. For one thing, we kicked the lawyers out of the room, much to their happiness, much to our happiness too, let me say. But there were no lawyers involved in those public policy inquiries, except perhaps to answer questions that might have arisen with regard to a particular issue that we had to look at. But the public policy review that we did was about that relationship. And as part of that process, we visited over 23 communities in this province in order to visit with people in the communities and invite them to tell us about their experiences with police officers, with the prosecutors, with defense lawyers, with the courts, with the correction system. We went into every jail in this province and held hearings and had the inmates talk to us about what it was like to be an inmate in our provincial institutions. We talked to wardens of all of the institutions and just asked them, what's it like dealing with Aboriginal inmates? So those policy hearings took up the bulk of our time, but it was a different kind of a hearing, a different kind of a process. Less formal, but nonetheless perhaps more meaningful for the general population. And less meaningful perhaps for the individual families who were involved in the Harper and Osborne cases, but nonetheless just as important. So the question of what an inquiry is going to look into is a very important question. The mandate of the inquiry is determined by legislation, but it's also determined by the terms of reference that are imposed upon it by the order in council or by the governing entity that creates it. And so developing those terms of reference are very important. The question of who will be involved and how, with, insofar as the inquiry is concerned, is also very key. And that needs to be known from the outset. Is it going to be an inquiry that will engage and has been directed to engage with Aboriginal people? Are Aboriginal people going to be allowed to participate in the development of the terms of reference? Those are questions that need to be known as you go forward. And I think the ultimate question is, 
how would Aboriginal people and how would Canada benefit from a public inquiry? What is it that we would learn from it that we don't know now? Or what is it that we know now that might be enhanced by holding an inquiry of the magnitude that some people are talking about? Those are questions that all go into the decision-making process about whether or not to hold an inquiry. And they are important questions. But where can Aboriginal people be involved in uh, an inquiry? In so far as my experience is concerned, both at the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry and the uh, Fatality Inquiry that was conducted into the Pediatric Cardiac Surgical Program as well as the TRC, the mandate of the Commission, the terms of reference that the Commission is given, the questions it is asked to answer, are questions that can be developed with government in consultation with or collaboration with Aboriginal people, Aboriginal leadership, Aboriginal organizations. And in this case, I would think because of the growing public nature, there might also be a public input into the development of the terms of reference. The appointment of commissioners would clearly be a significant question. Aboriginal people would probably want some way of it, trying to influence who the commissioners would be or who the commissioner would be if it is a single commissioner inquiry. The terms, the term of the commission, and by that I mean the length of time that the commission is given to do its work. Nobody likes an open-ended commission. Even as a commissioner, I can tell you I never liked knowing that there was no end to the work that we were going to do. I never liked thinking that I was going to do something like that for the rest of my life. I'd like there to be a fixed term. There's nothing that focuses you better than a deadline. And so a deadline for the commission to report is a, is a very key feature. It has to be reasonable, though. It has to be with enough time to be able to do the work that is necessary to be done. But the development of that term for the commission is something that the Aboriginal leadership can be involved in. And uh, I'm also talking about the families, because I think the families should be involved in this dialogue or these dialogues as well. The budget of the commission is key. Commissions always get underfunded. It just seems to be natural. Or perhaps, looking at it from the other perspective, commissions always spend more money than they're given. Ours is an exception um, at the TRC, because we were given a court-approved amount, and we were told we couldn't get any more than that. And yet the uh, budgets of commissions are always determinative eventually of what it is that the commission can do. And you have to spend within your budget and stay within your budget. And the amount of money that a commission like this might be required to have uh, could be substantial. I'll talk about why that would be in a minute. And uh, Aboriginal groups, families in particular, but Aboriginal organizations, Aboriginal leadership perhaps would also be able to participate through having standing at the commission. Having standing at a commission means that you have the right to be there, to participate, to ask questions, and to make submissions at the end of the day. And so that's a way that Aboriginal groups could be uh, involved in the evolution and function of a public inquiry of this nature. There are some unique issues around the potential inquiry for uh, missing, looking at missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Large number of cases, 17, uh, uh, 1,200 cases I think have been identified, but I'm told that there may be an additional number of, as well that may yet come under scrutiny. The role of family members in the, those missing and murdered cases would probably be the subject of an inquiry, uh, could be included in the inquiry's mandate and the varied and f similar nature of the known cases and whether a serial killer might be involved in some or all of the cases. I doubt all of them, of course, but certainly some of them might be attributable to a single individual or group of individuals. The geographical challenges that the cases present is also a very significant feature of this inquiry. A lot of the cases occurred in Western Canada, but they're not all in Western Canada. A lot of them are in urban areas, but they're not all in urban areas and they're not all in one particular jurisdiction. So a commission of inquiry, if it were looking at specific cases, would be called upon to travel extensively, or in this case, might be looking at establishing regional sub-inquiries 
And I've cited here an example of one such inquiry that did just that. Uh, the Australian government established a royal commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody back in the 1980s, studying all of those Aboriginal people who died while they were in police custody. And there were dozens and dozens of them all over the country. And instead of one commissioner traveling all over the, the country looking into each of those cases, he designated 23 other judges in all parts of Australia to inquire into the cases within their jurisdiction. And they became sub-commissioners who reported back to him. And then he wrote his report based upon their reports. And that's a possible model that could be followed in a case like this as well. Commission, uh, commissions are not allowed to look at criminality, but criminality is clearly an issue here. And therefore, a commission like this would have some limitations placed upon its ability to be able to deeply look at everything that occurred because uh, the rights of those who might be suspected of having behaved criminally would need to be respected. And the um, numbers of people who are missing, in fact, may not be yet well known because as we go through each day, it seems to me that there are more and more names of people being brought into the public forum of people who are missing. The question of whether some of the victims have been involved in the international sex trade is a, is a real significant issue that may be part of a, an inquiry like this, but there are limitations upon a national inquiry or a provincial inquiry uh, looking into matters of an international nature. You can't create a, an inquiry that has jurisdiction outside of your boundaries. And of course, whether or not gangs, street gangs or criminal gangs or criminal organizations either here or elsewhere in the world might be involved would clearly be something that a, an inquiry might be called upon to look into. I think the quality of police investigations is a big issue that uh, an inquiry might be called upon to look at. And that's a, a unique feature of the cases as they've come to the public attention. The role of social factors, poverty, employment or lack of employment uh, are, are all issues that, that have been raised. The connection to Indian residential schools. Uh, many of the missing and murdered women we know are survivors of survivors or survivors of of uh, survivors of survivors, so grandchildren of residential school survivors. And looking at the legacy of residential schools in, the, in those families and in those communities is also a significant question. We know and we've heard that uh, child welfare has been involved, child welfare authorities have been involved in the lives of many of these victims. And so the role that those agencies might have played in so far as failing to protect those children adequately, or those young people adequately, are failing to provide them with adequate resources so that they could move along career paths as they got into adulthood might be a question that an inquiry could look at. And the big question I think that uh, we need to start to examine is when do these numbers start to become so large? When we did the Aboriginal Justice Inquiry back in 1988, the numbers were not as significant as they are today. Uh, I remember reading a book called Just Another Dead Indian or just another Indian, about a woman who had been murdered in Saskatchewan. And at that time, the numbers of indigenous women who had uh, been victimized by that man who was convicted of that crime uh, was just, had just come to it, the attention of authorities. And it was beginning to be realized 20 years ago that maybe these numbers were becoming disproportionately high. But when you look at the numbers as reported in the RCMP statistics and the report that was referred to earlier, you can see that 20 years ago and 30 years ago, Aboriginal women were not victimized so disproportionately as they are today. And why are those numbers growing? It's a factor that needs to be considered. And indeed, the question always has been raised is as to the fact that they're all parts of high-risk lifestyle. They're all involved in a high-risk lifestyle. Uh, I think that's a misconception. I think that's one of those myths that's out there in order to justify not doing anything. And I think an inquiry could get to the bottom of that and determine whether, in fact, that was the case. 
But all of that speaks to the fact that inquiry is going to have a high expectations opposed upon it. And whether those high expectations will be adequately answered is a very serious question. And those of you who are supportive of or advocating for the creation of an inquiry need to realize that if you create an inquiry that cannot do what you expect it to do or want it to do, then you will not only be disappointing yourself and others, but you will also be creating a further sense of injustice. And so you need to be more focused upon what is it that an inquiry can accomplish and how can it accomplish it. One of the things that we need to look at as well is what's happening in other countries. Is this similar to other jurisdictions? I'm curious about that question. What's going on with Aboriginal women in the United States? Is this unique to Canada? What about Aboriginal women in Australia? What about Aboriginal women in New Zealand or even in Africa? Is this something that's only going on in this country? And if so, why is it only going on in this country? As I said, though, international reach for an inquiry is a limited question because you can't go outside of the inquiry, but you can always conduct research. You can always ask people to go out and find out the data, find out what this tells you. And whether or not an inquiry is ever held, those are still questions I think people can be pursuing. And the suggestion of there being a sex trade of women, indigenous women in the Great Lakes region as something that was recently mentioned and indicated that that might be an issue as well. And that needs to be looked into, could be part of this. One of the unique features of this, of the question of whether this uh, issue is something that an inquiry should look at is <clears throat> what has been going on with regard to government decision making. 2010, you may recall that the government of Canada decided to stop funding the Native Women's Association of Canada, which was conducting research into missing and murdered women in this country. Uh, what did the loss of that research do to the question of uh, the rising numbers? Was it uh, something that resulted in a beneficial change? Did they indeed use that money that they were not spending on research in other ways that benefited the indigenous community or the country? What, if anything, has been done since then with the resources that they have saved from not spending money on that? Has the number of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls decreased since 2010 as a result of government pronouncements about their change in policy? I think those are valid questions that inquiry should, could look into as well. And what has been the impact of the law and order agenda that the government has proposed as solutions to um, the victimization of indigenous women? Have more people in fact been prosecuted? Have more cases been solved? Have people in fact been caught and punished for doing this? Or have the numbers remained the same? Have those unsolved cases indeed been solved? So at an inquiry, as I said, the role of uh, Aboriginal people could be addressed through standing, through the ability to make presentations, through questioning of witnesses. Families would be allowed to give testimony. Families and communities could thereby um, become involved in a community healing process. I can tell you from experience with TRC that though there is a great deal of difficulty that is inherent in people coming forward and publicly talking about what they have experienced and what they have uh, learned from or learned as a result of hearing what happened to their relatives, there is still uh, uh, an inherent healing process that becomes engaged by that community participation because been my experience that survivors who hear other survivors speak benefit from that and their ability to collectively share with each other in the circles that we have created help them to be able to move forward as painful as that experience has been. We know that the families need to know more. We know that there are people who are saying that they know everything that's occurred, they know all that they need to know, but they haven't been sharing that with the families. We have families who are here today who have questions about what happened and when did things happen and what do the police know and what do the prosecutors know? What do other people know? 
and I think those are valid questions. The whole question of the relationship between police authorities and Aboriginal people is a troubling question that still remains to be properly addressed. We certainly pointed to it in the AJI back in 1991. I think it continues to be an ongoing question. But as I said, remember that the possibility of an inquiry failing to meet expectations is very high, and that can lead to further, a further and growing sense of injustice because the children of the ones who are with us here today are the ones who are going to carry that burden as we go forward. So a public inquiry, in, in short, is basically an official review. It's government ordered generally. It can be ordered in other ways. The purpose is usually to establish facts and causes of an event or an issue, and then it makes recommendations to government. It can be ordered by all levels of government in this country, provincial, territorial, as well as federal. And it can be appointly, uh, jointly appointed by both levels of government. So we have examples of inquiries that have been appointed at, concurrently by the federal government along with provincial government. There has to be legislation upon which an inquiry is based, and uh, we already have that. Um, there's some suggestion, perhaps, that indigenous groups might be able to create an inquiry, and they can, but because it's not legislatively based, it will be very limited in what it can achieve. And so we need to keep that in mind. All inquiries are advisory in nature. They have no capacity to, to uh, order government or order responding parties to do anything. They're supposed to be independent of government, but at best they are semi-independent because government has a, a, long, a strong influence to play with regard to the development of the mandate and the funding that they receive. Uh, proceedings are supposed to be held in public, but almost all inquiries also have authority to hold in camera or private proceedings behind closed doors. And public inquiries are different from other kinds of reviews and investigations. I'm not going to go into all of those, but certainly the one thing that people need to keep in mind is that a public inquiry is not a court proceeding. So you cannot compel through a public inquiry the same kinds of things that you could compel or achieve through a court proceeding. They look the same in some ways. You have a presiding official, you have lawyers, you have witnesses, you have power of subpoena, you have contempt power. But an inquiry cannot make a legal finding of guilt or a finding of liability. So even though they may be able to conclude that somebody did something to somebody else, they cannot conclude that that's a criminal act. They are precluded from doing that. And they cannot force the government to act on its advice, whereas courts can do so. Courts are independent of government. Every uh, time that government has attempted to interfere with courts, courts have swatted them back. Courts can make finding of guilt, uh, findings of guilt or liability. Courts can compel parties to act upon their orders. And courts can and must determine any question that's brought before it. Inquiries are limited only to those questions they are given to answer. So if something comes up that's not part of their mandate, they're not allowed to look into it. Inquiries clearly have to stay within the terms of their mandate. And criminal investigations are different from public inquiries as well. Generally, criminal investigations are conducted by police agencies and are largely conducted out of the public eye. Uh, sometimes criminal investigations cooperate with public inquiries. In Quebec right now, they have an inquiry looking into corruption in the construction industry and uh, the role of uh, criminal organizations and police authorities are cooperating with and in fact are sometimes even charging people whose names get revealed during the course of those inquiries. Criminal investigations can lead to criminal charges if evidence is adequate, so a police officer determines they have enough evidence to charge somebody, he has the authority to lay a charge, but a public inquiry has no authority to charge anybody. Now those are limitations that people need to keep in mind. All of which is to say that when we look at the question of public inquiries, we need to understand that there are limitations around them, that they are not the be-all for everything. They will not solve everything. They have a purpose. They can achieve certain things, but they will not solve everything. There's a lot of things that inquiries cannot do that perhaps people think they will be able to do, and we need to be careful about managing those expectations because 
if we lead ourselves to believe, or if we lead others to believe, that holding an inquiry is now going to occur and therefore that's all that needs to happen, then we will forget about all of the hard work that's going to have to come about or that we are going to have to do still even before the inquiry is created. Thank you. <laughs>